Welcome back, students, to another message in our series on the book of James. Uh, if you don't know me, my name is Robert Lee, and I am the pastor of student ministries at Sheboygan E. Free. And I am so thankful to have another opportunity to proclaim, to herald God's word for you all. And uh, can you believe that already we are over halfway through the letter of James? And, and tonight, uh, there will only be 30 more, uh, 37 more verses to study after tonight. And that means we have covered a lot of ground. Uh, in chapter 1, verses 2 through 18, James has taught us how God calls his people to respond to suffering, focusing on the theme of, of trials. And in chapter 1, verses 19 through 27, the next section, James urged us to be quick to, to hear and, and slow to speak and slow to anger, becoming people with sharpened listening skills so that ultimately we might listen to the voice of God. But in that same section, James also makes clear that we must not only hear God's word, but also do his word. He wants us to be doers. And really, in the following section, James stays focused on doing the word. That is practical, everyday obedience to the teachings of Jesus. For James, talk is cheap. He wants to see. He wants to see how our relationship with God makes a difference. Hence, in chapter 2, verses 1 through 13, James gets very specific, and, and he addresses the sin of partiality, which is when we give special treatment or favor or honor to, another, to a person, often from a, a higher social status, while ignoring and neglecting another so that we might gain in some way. Then in the rest of chapter 2, verses 14 through 26, kind of another section, James continues to push us to recognize the importance, the, the, the essential nature of doing the word, not hearing only. And he does this by exploring the relationship between faith and works, faith and works, arguing that a faith without practical obedience to the teachings of Christ will not receive God's final approval on the day of judgment. In our passage last week, chapter 3, verses 1 through 12, James doesn't lose this emphasis on faithful obedience in daily life as he discusses something that we all must wrestle with Monday through Sunday, and that is the way we speak, how we use our tongues. Because according to James, our tongue, although it's small, it has potential to direct us towards spiritual maturity or to consume and ravage our entire lives like a, a roaring forest fire. Now, if you remember from last week, James ended by noting a serious problem among the readers and among humans in general. And that is, with the same tongues we use to praise God, we also use to curse and afflict the very people made in his image. And, and James says, this ought not to be so. If our natures have truly been changed by God, then in the same way a, a garden weed in your backyard doesn't produce strawberries, if we are God's people, our speech will not be do not dominated by evil. And this is important to note because in our passage tonight, James continues to focus on how we treat others. Right? He's all about practical faith. And to get at this topic, he, he frames it within the discussion of wisdom. That is, James is going to argue that when a person possesses true wisdom, wisdom from God, he or she will demonstrate it by walking in humility toward others, by living in such a way that promotes blessing, not cursing. And in this way, James gives us criteria a standard to judge whether a person lives according to the wisdom that comes from above or according to the wisdom from below. So, so let's first read and pray, and then we'll dig into God's word together. Uh, the passage is James chapter 3, uh, verses 13 through 18. Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. 
This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder in every vile practice. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial, and sincere, and a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you would fill me with boldness and passion that corresponds to the magnitude of the truths in this passage. I pray that you would let me communicate them clearly, and I pray as I do, Father, that you would open up the hearts of the listeners the students, that their hearts might be shaped and challenged and, and confronted with what is true wisdom. What does it look like? And I pray, Father, that you would give them discernment to, to, to judge, to, to, to assess, to evaluate what is worldly wisdom and what is holy wisdom. And so, Father, I pray that you would give us that capacity to do together. And I pray this message would serve to that end. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So James opens up our passage, as he's done a few times already, with a question. He, he writes in verse 13, Who is wise and understanding among you? And as I mentioned before, James likes questions. He likes to use them because he wants us, the readers, to self-reflect, to really examine our beliefs. And so before we move forward and, and discuss James's understanding of wisdom, let's take a few moments and pose this question to ourselves. Who is wise and understanding among us? Who in our lives would we point to and say, that person has wisdom? Or better, let's ask ourselves, who do I respect and admire? Who do I want to be like? Who, who do I look up to? Now, we might not use the words wise or, or understanding to describe the people we admire and aspire to be like our mentors, whether nearby or from afar. More likely, young people would use words like cool, beast, savage, or some other hip expression that I'm not aware of. But, but don't be misled. If we think someone is cool, if we admire someone, then at some level, the chances are we also think that they are wise. At, at least we, we act like they're wise. That is, at, at some level, we think that their view and, and the way they view and act in the world is, is going to bring about personal happiness and success. And since we want happiness, we want success, we want good, often we'll emulate, we'll, we'll imitate these mentors. We'll, we'll, we'll value what they value. We'll laugh at what they laugh at, seek what they seek, spend time how they spend time. You get the picture. The people we admire, the people we think are wise and, and understanding, we will likely adopt their beliefs, their view of the world, and imitate their behaviors. For, for example, uh, for some of the most formative years of my life, I grew up in a neighborhood uh, in which many people glorified drugs, sex, money, violence. And, and so who did I look up to? Who did I consider wise and understanding? Well, the drug dealer across the street, the gangsters who toted guns and claimed to be dangerous, Famous rappers who boasted about how much money they made and how many women they slept with and how they were the most impressive human being on the planet. They're not. Now, like you all, uh, I might not have used the words wise or understanding to describe them, but nevertheless, I thought they were living the good life. And so what I do? Well, I took up their beliefs and I followed in their footsteps toward a path of destruction. So, so let me ask you again. Who is wise and understanding among you? Whose view of the world are you adopting and modeling your life after? Maybe you really respect and admire a professional athlete like, um, you know, the greatest basketball player of all times, uh, LeBron James. Yeah, I said it. Or maybe you look up to your favorite music artist. Or maybe you love a particular actor or actress or even a famous video gamer, or, or maybe you follow a few YouTubers or TikTokers, whoever they are, I want you to keep them in your mind. 
because in the rest of the passage, James is going to describe who is wise and understanding in God's eyes, from God's perspective. Put another way, James is going to tell us how to discern true heavenly wisdom from false worldly wisdom. And so at the end of this message, my hope is that we will be equipped to evaluate ourselves and the different people we look up to, to see whether we or they are exercising wisdom that comes from God or from below. Now, now in the second half of verse 13, James responds to the question he raised. Start reading with me from the beginning. Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. Well, like in his discussion on faith and works, James says, oh, oh, you, you claim to be wise? Okay, show me. Prove to me that you're wise. And then James gives two ways to do so. First, James says, by his good conduct, let him show his works. The word translated as conduct refers to our overall lifestyle how we carry ourselves on a daily basis, the general orientation and, and pattern of our everyday habits. That is, how we talk, the attitude of our heart, the decisions and choices we make. And the word good could also be translated as, as noble or praiseworthy. And basically, it's used here to describe one's upright and, and moral activity. To put it all together then, and, and this comes as no surprise to us, I'm sure, James says that a person shows that he or she is wise by living an upright, godly life characterized by integrity, honor, and virtue. As we have seen, James would see this person as one who controls his tongue, serves the vulnerable, and resists the temptations of sin in the world. Again, from the rest of our time in the letter, we know that James has vigorously argued that we must hear and do the word, that our faith must produce practical obedience. So it makes sense that he would say the same thing about wisdom. In fact, we learned earlier in the letter that James derives his view of what, what constitutes wisdom from, from the Old Testament. That is, James likely defines wisdom as, as having this capacity to view the world from God's perspective, to understand the world from his perspective, and then to act in accordance with that perspective, to live into God's truth. But then, besides one's conduct, he gives another way we can see who has wisdom. Start reading with me again at the second half of verse 13. James writes, By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. Here, James says, not only do your actions matter, but how, how you carry them out does as well. And in this passage, true wisdom is demonstrated by obedience done with the meekness that comes from wisdom. That's what James says. Now, understanding that word meekness is key to this passage because this stands as one of the defining marks of wisdom, which distinguishes it from false wisdom, as James will go on to explain. And, and the word meekness describes a, a quality or a trait of a person who exercises a kind and considerate attitude and behavior toward others. Uh, put another way, meekness is anti-harsh, anti-cruel. It doesn't squash the hearts of others. It, it doesn't throw the mistakes of people in their faces. It, it doesn't correct them with an irritated tone or, or an attitude of superiority, but rather, Meekness considers and handles the hearts of people with care. It's, it's charitable and, and tender, non-condemning. It's, it's hospitable and friendly, not brutal or vicious. So then when James says one can show wisdom by good conduct in the meekness of wisdom, he is saying that the wise person treats others with gentleness and a friendly attitude, promoting uh, uh, unity among the body of believers. Put simply, James says, you can tell the wise by how they treat others on a daily basis. 
as I mentioned earlier, in this section, James is following up on the exhortation he made about how we often praise God and curse people with the same tongue. And so he's coming against, right now, he's coming against our tendency to be sharp and critical, cursing others uh, with our tongues. He's coming against this type of behavior that is not inspired by the wisdom of God. Now, after setting meekness out before us as the defining mark of wisdom, James turns to describe false wisdom. James writes in chapter four, uh, chapter uh, three, verse fourteen. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. Here, James connects verse fourteen to verse thirteen with the word "but." which signals to us that he's making a contrast between the wisdom demonstrated by meekness and to its antithesis, its opposite, which he describes as having bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts. Interestingly, that word translated as jealousy doesn't always carry a negative sense to it. In fact, it can be translated as zeal in a positive sense. For, for example, in John chapter 2, verse 17, speaking about Jesus after he just flipped over some tables and, and kicked some people out of the temple, it, it says this, verse 17, His disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house will consume me. In this way, the word simply describes an intense dedication to something or to someone, and in Jesus' case, his father's house. But when it's used negatively, as it is in our passage, hence James calls it a bitter jealousy, the word carries that same kind of intensity, but instead of an intense dedication to, to a positive cause or person, it's a passionate commitment to self, to me, to my ambitions, my desires, my goals. Indeed, a bitter jealousy is so concerned and obsessed with personal advancement that it drives people to resent and despise others for having what, that, what they want. So much so that they become willing to hurt them to advance their own agenda. And we see this in the book of Acts, in chapter 5 verses 17 and 18, when the religious leaders, intensely concerned for their own reputation, put the apostles in jail. Uh, look, the author, uh, Luke, the author, writes this, starting in verse 17. But the high priest rose up, and all who were with him, that is, the party of the Sadducees, and filled with jealousy, same word, they arrested the apostles and put them in the public prison. In this example, the religious leaders couldn't stand to see these apostles threaten their social position. So their, their lust, their zeal for the people's respect and commitment pushed them to arrest innocent men. And, and directly related to this bitter jealousy, James also says a sign of false wisdom is selfish ambition, which is when we always want to be better than someone else. It's, it's this competitive drive to always establish our superiority above others. Selfish ambition views people as rivals to overcome, suppress, or defeat. In summary then, we could, we could boil down these two signs of false wisdom, bitter jealousy and selfish ambition, to describe an attitude of the heart that always asks, what's in it for me? How can I gain? Put simply, a deep self-centeredness is the opposite of true wisdom. Hence, in the second half of verse 14, James says, if, if that's in your heart, then, then don't boast and be false to the truth. In other words, don't brag about being wise. Don't claim to be understanding because the way you live directly contradicts your words. After naming some core traits of, of false wisdom, James goes on to further describe the source, where this thirst and, and hunger for personal gain comes from. Look at verse 15 with me. James writes, 
This, that is a self-centered way of life, is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. First, James makes it clear. This what's in it for me attitude doesn't come from above. It doesn't derive from God's wisdom. Rather, James says it's, it's earthly, which is to say that it's earth bound, not from heaven. It's, it's created and shaped and promoted by the corrupt and divisive impulses of sinful creatures. It's unspiritual. That means ruled by human reason and feeling, not the spirit of God. And lastly, with with climactic fashion, James pulls no punches and says, it's straight up demonic. It's of the devil. Now, is James just being (laughs) overdramatic? Is this too strong of a condemnation? I mean, how bad, really, is a little jealousy or selfish ambition? Doesn't it sometimes drive us to be better? Can it motivate us to work harder? Well, perhaps. But what we might gain will be lost for what our selfish, competitive desires destroy. Look look at what James says in verse 16. He writes, For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder in every vile practice. In other words, James says, A what's-in-it-for-me attitude will promote chaos and, and every sort of form of wickedness. And most of us have seen how this is true, right? Especially among siblings, actually. Uh, we've seen how when we're jealous of our brother or sister because they maybe they get to do things that we're not allowed to do yet or because we perceive them as uh, more attractive, smarter, more talented, more loved by our mom or dad, this, this jealousy turns into a resentment that might show itself in maybe maybe even feeling worthless about ourselves or... Maybe we turn outward and and put down and and tease our siblings or even try to sabotage their reputation in front of mom and dad or friends. I mean, we can't forget the classic example of how jealousy can harm a family as demonstrated in the life of Joseph. When his brothers became jealous of him, they contemplated killing him, taking him out, and then ended up selling him into slavery. Or... Maybe you're jealous of a classmate or a friend, so you get angry and make up lies and talk behind their backs. Or think about the teammates who who never pass the ball or sacrifice for the team because they're greedy for their own glory. Or that student who always makes these like uh, snarky, sarcastic comments and put others down because they want to make themselves look funny and, and cool. Or a person who starts a rumor to ruin another student's reputation out of jealousy? Or what about a parent who is never home or, and never comes to any of their kids' activities because they are so consumed with advancing at work? In, in all of these examples, we can see how self-centeredness, this what's-in-it-for-me attitude, this me, me, me-centered view, doesn't promote blessing and unity, but pain, hate, and hostility, which is exactly why James calls it demonic, evil. And and noting the marks of worldly wisdom after doing that, James now tells us what heavenly wisdom looks like. Look look at verse 17. James writes, "But, But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. And here, here James strings this list of words together to describe the wisdom that comes from above. Now, instead of explaining the significance of each word, I, I want to direct our eyes to Jesus and how he perfectly exemplified the wisdom James describes in this passage. And I, and I make this connection because, well, well Scripture does. That is, the apostles claimed that the one who came down from above, Jesus, is the wisdom of God. The apostle Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 1, verses 22 to 24, For Jews demand signs, and and Greeks seek wisdom. But we, we preach Christ 
crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Later in the same letter, chapter 1, verse 30, Paul writes again, And because of him, that is God, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God. And then in Colossians chapter 2, verses 2 and 3, Paul writes that their hearts, the, the Christians in Colossae, their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love to reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Students, Jesus is the human embodiment of divine heavenly wisdom. Hence, Jesus is pure. Although tempted beyond our imagination, coming face to face with the Satan himself, even to the point of death, Jesus never yielded to sin. He, he never lost control of his tongue. He never had a lustful thought. He never became jealous of another. Jesus remained fully and completely unpolluted by evil. The life of Jesus also demonstrates, show, uh, demonstrates how he is peaceable, gentle, and, and open to reason. I mean, he deals tenderly with the broken sinner, forgiving prostitutes and, and tax collectors, but most supremely at the cross. His, his passion for peace shines brightest, for he forfeited the, the splendor and glory of heaven to be ruthlessly murdered by the very ones he came to save. Jesus loves peace, so much so that he'll die for it. He's also full of, of mercy and good fruits. Hence, while on earth, he healed the lepers, gave sight to the blind, and, and fed thousands of hungry bellies. As he says in Mark chapter 10, verse 44, he came to serve, not to be served. He didn't come to give mere well wishes. He came to work, to get his hands dirty, to, to love people in practical ways. Lastly, Jesus is also impartial and sincere. For he courageously confronted the, the false teachers and hypocrites in power. He, he was not swayed by their social position or influence. He didn't compromise truth to gain their approval. Rather, he boldly proclaimed the truth in the face of adversity, even till it cost him his life. He never wavered or stumbled in fear. He remained steady and just in all his decisions. Students, can you see the wisdom of the incomparable Christ. He is the one worthy to be praised, worshipped, and followed. He's the one we can trust to lead and guide us in this broken world. So, so again, let me ask you, who is wise in understanding among you? Who do you admire and look up to? Do they measure up to Christ, the wisdom of Christ? Do they live in such a way that if you follow them, then you will be following Christ? If not, I plead with you to reconsider who you want to emulate your life after. We, we, we must decide. Do we want the wisdom from above, Jesus Christ, or do we want the wisdom from below? Let's pray. Father, you are so good. Every good and perfect gift comes from above, from you, with whom there is uh, no variation or shadow due to change. You are unchanging in your character and your pur purposes, Father, in your nature. And, and we trust that you have given us your Son, the perfect embodiment of wisdom. And Lord, I pray that you would, by your Spirit, draw our hearts to him. Draw our eyes to him. Let us emulate his life and not the, the lives of the false teachers in this world who are promoting a worldly wisdom. Thank you, Father. You are gracious and merciful. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.